And I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. We continue now looking at the crypto novella that is the crypto space, particularly at this moment. We're going to look back at the Ethereum drama with Simon Dixon of Back to the Future and Stacy Simon Dixon. Let's continue where we picked up, where we left off. The Ethereum drama. Um, so, yeah, uh, just to give a little backstory for those who are just catching up to this, there was uh, a split. There was a hard fork. Yes, there was a split between these two versions of Ethereum in response to a hacker to try and compensate investors for money that was stolen um, through this new structure, venture capital fund-like structure called the DAO, which was built upon the principles of the Coders Law. Yes, and of course one uh, argument at the time before the theft or before the uh, legitimate use of the smart contract, whatever way you want to look at it, before that, many in the financial space uh, were pointing out that none of these people did due diligence, which venture capital funds do do a lot of due diligence. These people didn't seem to do any due diligence. But you mentioned that uh, the code is law or with, the, with Ethereum Classic, but with this uh, new hard forked Ethereum, they, uh, the code is law except in exceptional circumstances. Now, one of the uh, critiques I read of the disaster and the, and the um, you know the theft and the uh, their how they responded to it is that lawyers who looked at it crypto lawyers said well the problem with the original foundation of the DAO how they wrote it is they didn't establish a jurisdiction now Max has often pointed out that with most banks they have an arbitration panel and every anytime you sign a contract with them it's their arbitration panel that you go to and you know you you talk to this arbitration panel or you know J, if you have a bigger case JP Morgan might you know you might sue them in courts in the US that's their jurisdiction well with this there was no jurisdiction established not even an arbitration panel so therefore the lawyer said all jurisdictions are now the the jurisdiction of the DAO so it is being reported that the SEC has contacted some people in the crypto space to ask about the DAO. So there could be a situation where they are open to legislation or certainly the Department of Justice in the United States. Yeah, I mean, and this is just a real, a real case study of how uh, I don't think law was ready to be disrupted. Um, people invest through funds and equity because it gives investors certain protections um, and those protections don't need disrupting. We've established that basically the DAO, the Ethereum, this is perhaps a more naive way to respond to well, it. Well, it is important that I do believe there is a user case of smart contracts. You know, in, in sure. the future, JP Morgan's going to need to write swaps and futures contracts and, you know, Reggie Middleton's creating technology that allow them to do that in a peer-to-peer -peer environment. So smart contracts is an important technology, but this particular user case of venture capital proved to be an epic failure. Okay, now there's a user <laughs> case in this crypto novella that has been ongoing, uh, always new, crazy, bizarre storylines going on over the last few months is Bitfinex, which was, you know them, they're in Hong Kong. Explain what they were actually providing, what happened to them. They had a huge theft of $70 million worth of Bitcoin, and how did they respond that was unique um, and that could possibly give lessons to the you know the the, the banking the, our financial system that does need disrupting. Yeah, so I mean you know there's lessons all over the place in all of these stories. Um, a disclaimer I should make first is that we are working with the Bitfinex team on a recovery plan for their equity. So full disclosure there. Mm -hmm. um, but the you know the the Bitfinex case is an example of you know it, tying it to the last story, the coders law. No one's ever released code that doesn't have any bugs, and when there is a bug, you can get hacked on a large scale. And when you get hacked on a large scale, uh, that's exactly what happened with Bitfinex. So um, they had a, 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 a supposedly secure setup on their exchange, um, whereby uh, you know it was in, in theory a good setup, but there was a flaw, um, whereby a hacker actually managed to get hold of eighty million dollars, approximately seventy-two million or so, of client funds, uh, client bitcoins. And so uh, Bitfinex were looking at what happened, what do we have in history to learn from? Well, we have Mt. Gox, and Mt. Gox was the largest hack or whatever it was of $450 million worth of Bitcoin. Um, and <laughs> the so, thefts are way larger than anything you've ever heard of, the gold heists or like any of the <laughs> Wild West sort of thing, like way bigger. Yeah, so what, what Bitfinex did is that they, they wanted to do a fast response um, in order to try and compensate their investors 
um, and get back to business and not run away and leave it to the liquidators and the arbitration process because with Mt. Gox, no one's got any compensation, the lawyers have got paid lots of money, and no one really knows where it's going next. So they took a, a response out of a bad situation, which is they were engaged in not only Bitcoin um, in a Bitcoin exchange, they also did Bitcoin margin lending. And Bitcoin margin lending means that people were lending their dollars and lending their Bitcoins for people that wanted to short or go long mm. on Bitcoin. Mm. So they had a, a, you know, a fairly large um, capital base um, to work with. And they calculated, and you know, the reports are still to come out, but they calculated that if they uh, did a haircut of 36% of all of their clients' Bitcoins or US dollars, um, then they, they and replace that with a debt, uh, then they could um, essentially get back to business, start trading, and try and repay their um, their, uh, their 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 haircutters, their victims of the hack. Yeah. Um, and uh, what they did is they actually created this new token. So they they created this token called BFX. Um, and BFX was a representation. Each BFX token represented one dollar that was hacked and represented the amount that they considered owing to the to the victims. Um, and this started trading on the open market. So we created almost since a, a blockchain, well Bitfinex created a blockchain solution to representing the amount um, so that clients could see it and then it started trading on the open market. Immediately it crashed from one dollar to uh, 30, 30 cents which meant that people could actually speculate on whether Bitfinex would recover. Yeah. And so they could buy, you know, uh, if speculators could buy this debt token, whatever you call it, um, for 30 cents on the dollar. And if Bitfinex recovers, it's possibly going to be worth a dollar in the future. Um, or they could do other things with those BFX tokens. And, you know, it was, it was, it, it, there was systemic risk in people that were trading Bitcoins. It's important to remember that Bitcoin was not hacked. Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is a zero counterparty risk um, protocol or currency. But in order to exchange it for dollars, you need to go to an exchange, and Bitfinex was one of those. And they also built derivatives products. Um, and they were the most successful exchange uh, in this space at the moment. Okay, so it's pretty remarkable that you had a, a crypto uh, coin creators come up with a response to what would, have, as you point out, the contrast with Mt. Gox is that it's gone into kind of the legal high grass and there's going to be lawyers and litigation and they're going to be talking about this for a long time. The Bitfinex folks actually went into their, uh, their bag of crypto technologies and they whipped up a coin to, uh, as, as a um, kind of a bridge uh, into uh, another place to keep, keep operating. Yep. And um, they didn't go through chapter 11, chapter seven. They just created this temp, this, this temp coin or bridge coin, uh, which people could then speculate. So the question is, has the crypto market reached a point where people are now savvy enough and they're now understanding the issues where they, they really are, have the ability to divorce themselves from the entrenched financial system globally and to create a new kind of global system using this uh, now this aggregate knowledge and and to take it into a new direction it, it, it are we are we at that point what do you think I think that is the point we're reaching to we're not there yet I mean there's many people living in the crypto space that don't have anything to do with traditional financial products um, and you know they're they're able to spend their bitcoins anywhere with debit cards or uh, they're able to create, you know, there's financial products for everything. There's, there's lessons that are coming out from all of this. So, you know, the lessons, the takeaways, I think, that are coming out is that Ethereum produced a great case study of what could have happened to Bitcoin if Bitcoin did respond to the block size debate. Um, rather than creating those private solutions like Kim.com or the protocol level solutions like Blockstream or developers being very conservative and implementing their own solutions, um, we could have had the same situation in Bitcoin and it proved that actually the developers were right, being conservative is the right strategy. Wow, and, fantastic. And, and what is the response, what is the lesson learned from Bitfinex for the financial system? Because of course, when um, basically the financial system was drained of a lot of capital through fraudulent derivatives products, uh, the response was the central banks came in and bailed out uh, a certain sector of the economy, which is the banks. Now Bitfinex responded to this massive loss um, with basically socialized losses across even the even account holders who had held no Bitcoin they held just Litecoin or US dollars they took a cut because that's also what would have happened in bankruptcy court anyway yeah so 
but they came out with this token. And what sort of lesson is there a lesson for, say, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, RBS, and Barclays, and all these other banks? Well, the the, the lesson is the uh, so what what did Bitfinex do? You could compare it to a bailout. So in in Cyprus, they bailed in their depositors at times of crisis. Bitfinex bailed in their depositors at times of crisis, but they created a blockchain asset to represent what they consider themselves owing. And they were one week later back in business without having to pay loads and loads of money to arbitrators, liquidators. So they gave um, their depositors a, a bail-in, but they also gave them a stake in if they grow in the future that they would get their recovery. Yeah, so but here, in the, nobody got a stake in any of these banks that we bailed out. No. And the other thing that it did is it didn't go immediately to the government because there's no lender of last resort, there's no government bailout, there's no insurance tax on deposits. So immediately it went to market solutions. So we're looking at several market solutions now. At Bank to the Future, we're seeing how people can exchange their uh, BFX tokens for equity at par value so that they gain an equity stake in the company um, if they still believe in it. If they don't, they can go to the market and they can sell them at a discount and take the loss. Um, or they can hold out and uh, the more people that convert to equity, the less debt. Um, and uh, you can end up with a scenario where they you know, might get repaid. Okay, let me jump in because uh, you sent me a message uh, recently, pretty excited about it, that Canada, Canada Central Bank is now getting very serious about cryptocurrency, issuing their own cryptocurrency. The United Kingdom is also talking about this. You see it's kind of a big picture here. Uh, we've got about a minute or so left. Can you give, 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 give us your update on this? Yeah, so um, approximately six central banks, Canada actually launching, launching a product that was actually usable, um, have now started issuing their own digital currencies, which is a wallet that sits on your phone. Um, and you can take that wallet and you can exchange your bank deposits by buying the equivalent of this central bank created money. Um, essentially, what you're doing on the economic scale is you're taking money away from the bank deposits and you're exchanging it for central bank money, which is a new money supply, extinguishes the money from banks and replaces it with a, bank, a central bank deposit. Is there any risk that they're doing this in response to a perceived risk that these banks are in trouble? I could only think of a few reasons why they're doing this. Either it's part of their war on cash because they want to track every transaction and eliminate cash, or they are actually putting together a, a plan for, to, for systemic risk in banking where if they need to uh, everyone to exchange their bank deposits for central bank money, then they could allow the banks to go bust and uh, clients could be compensated with central bank money. All right, and you've actually used a product up there in Canada. It's live, we used it, um, yeah, and All it's right. working. Fantastic, well, Simon Dixon, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Simon Dixon of banktothefuture.com. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.